Jai Hind and welcome to Dev Talks. This is Adi Achind. As you can see, I have with me Lieutenant General Syed Atta Hasnain, who's going to take us through the whole world. As a matter of fact, there's going to be a mention of every part of the world in this talk, and I hope that we are able to have a nice broad-based discussion as to how the world is going to change because of Ukraine and the events in Southeast Asia that are starting to begin. Thank you, sir, for joining me. It's an interesting time for geopolitical analysts. There's lots to read and no time in the day. Thank you very much, uh, Adi, and Jai Hind to all our viewers. Sir, begin to ask you because you know the we see a sudden shift of focus towards the east. Everybody is starting to talk about China back again, which was basically the case till about December last year, uh, post which the Russians armed up and you know the entire focus went on to Europe. But we see the whole thing shifting again. Indian focus in the South China Sea, the Quad, the Americans doing some exercises there. How do you see this entire global shift to the east? Yes, and and the most in, interesting event coming up, the Shangri La dialogue, which is also coming up very soon in, in Singapore, right? So, uh, of course, as you say very correctly, yes, there's very very interesting times, uh, geopolitics at its best, and and a, and a great time for for analysts to put their minds to it and see what is the likely future. Uh, why has the focus suddenly shifted to the East? Well, wariness with the West, I suppose. Uh, everyone expected that Ukraine would be over in seven days, ten days, twenty days, maybe a month. It's now hundred days and counting, and it's still not over. And uh, obviously, the United States does not want to get bogged down. The whole purpose of getting out of Afghanistan, and the whole purpose of uh, pursuing a, the policies in the Middle East leading to the Abraham Accords, was all about stabilizing these two fronts. Afghanistan itself and the Middle East. These have been uh, stabilized, well, largely stabilized. Taliban is not doing too much to upset the, 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 the game at the moment. But no one expected this will happen in Ukraine. And uh, once it started in Ukraine, the Americans probably thought that this will be over in a couple of days. It didn't happen. So obviously, the, they feel the carpet, or the rug slipping out under their feet with the, uh, the Indo-Pacific, and if they don't start doing something there, they don't start getting hold of their, their partnerships, uh, get them together. There are so many partnerships in the, in, in, in the Indo-Pacific, one uh, some, somehow uh, doesn't have count of them. So they wanted to make sure that the interest does not run out. And uh, the Chinese don't do something which is going to surprise everyone. So they wanted a full consideration of it. And uh, Joe Biden, obviously, then took Took it upon himself to take on the leadership, uh, conduct the summit, the Quad summit, and the Quad has been meeting very, very often in the recent past, as we can see. Uh, set up a small economic dialogue and economic uh, agreement and understanding. Uh, all this, uh, obviously, with a mind to ensure that the focus of the world comes back to the Indo-Pacific. Uh, the Chinese don't get a free run; that they get, may get a perception. That with what's happening in, in three other parts of the world, that's in Europe, or Afghanistan, South Asia, and the Middle East, that they have uh, all the flexibility to do what they wish and pursue uh, their policies as they wish to. Uh, I think the messaging has been quite strong, and the counter messaging has been, or the pushback has been equally strong. Uh, two areas, if you see, it. one is a very awkward one: the the the, the fly pass, so called, which uh, the uh, Russian and the and the Chinese air forces in a, in, a, in a joint exercise did by trying to intimidate the leadership of the court, which was at that time in Japan, uh, flying over the East China Sea and into the Pacific and uh, things like that. And the second, of course, immediately after that, we find the Chinese foreign minister, his visit to the South Pacific Islands, particularly the Solomon Islands. Uh, but mercifully, we also see uh, something uh, uh, Emerging from there, where you find the South Pacific Islands themselves have not accepted the, the Chinese hand of partnership, perhaps with the perception of what is happening on the Belt and Road Initiative with many other nations, like what happened to Sri Lanka, what's happening to Pakistan and many other nations. Perhaps these nations would prefer to wait it out and see what really is the intent and the capability uh, of this kind of cooperation which the Chinese are seeking. So 
This is a balancing of the world with attention with, with a very critical situation in, in Europe, East Europe, and at the same time, a lot of attention and focus coming uh, to the Indo-Pacific, and we will be very, very carefully watching the Shangri-La dialogue in Singapore. Absolutely, sir. I mean, uh, in the list that we, I missed out the, the rim pack, which is going to take place at the end of the month. So that's going to be another interesting. Yes, yes, absolutely. You know, uh, again, a military geopolitical event. So what would you kind of say to a uh, thought process that USA is picking up two fights with two major enemies at the same time? Yes, uh, the United States is careful when it picks up uh, fights around the world. It doesn't uh, commit itself completely into something unless uh, the response back home is very strong. For example, the, uh, the triggering of by 9-11, what happened with Afghanistan within weeks, the United States uh, armed forces were in Afghanistan because uh, the whole uh, psyche of the uh, American nation had been hurt at that point. Two years later in 2003, they were battling the same adversary. The Al-Qaeda, they were battling in Afghanistan and they were battling the Al-Qaeda again on reports of the presence of the Al-Qaeda in, uh, in, in Iraq, AQII as it was called. Uh, they went into Iraq and, and the, for the better part of the next eight years. So they were fighting on two fronts or they were fighting in two regions. They had committed and deployed the troops to two regions, but they were fighting a common adversary. And that was essentially the Al-Qaeda, or you can say the Islamist at, at large. Here now, Ukraine also is not a classic commitment. The United States has committed a lot of money. They've committed a lot of their focus. Uh, but this is still a war by proxy, as they're saying that uh, the United States is willing to fight in the last Ukrainian. Uh, it is really not, uh, they're not confronting the, the Russian uh, army directly on a one one on one again in, in in East Europe against the Chinese. Uh, I think the Americans are quite certain this not coming to war yet. The uh, by all assessments, if you say it, the year two thousand twenty two is too premature even for the Chinese to try and intimidate the the Americans. Uh, naval power, particularly, if you see on the naval front. The United States uh, rules the oceans very largely, right? And, uh, and uh, of course, it, they are expressing their concern. You can see the visit of General Flynn is taking place to India at the moment. Uh, yesterday, he was in meeting with the, uh, with the Indian Army chief, with a number of other people. He is the land forces commander, the commander of the land forces component of the uh, U.S. Uh, uh, of the Pacific uh, Command, which is in Hawaii, right? So... They are, they are getting their act together and making sure that the messaging is correct. But I think they're quite certain that at the moment, neither place are they really going to do a situation where they need to commit troops. Uh, and I think that situation will continue for some time. The United States will remain careful about this particular aspect. Sir, so what would you actually say to the European Union, who's at the forefront today in front of, in front of Russia, there's that NATO tangle with Finland and Sweden. There is uh, remilitarization. The sanctions are starting to kind of bite. And that's something that is coming out from the Hungarian prime minister, the Slovakian prime minister. Even the Italians seem to be on a little bit of a wary foot with regards to this entire thing. How do you see the EU beginning to cope up with what is happening and their reactions going forward, sir? See, uh, Adi, this is a very interesting uh, situation emerging because I think, for one, no one expected this war to elongate to the kind of extent that it is elongated. Everyone thought that uh, they put sanctions and, uh, and uh, come probably uh, four weeks down the line, uh, you know, things would be hunky-dory perhaps and there would be uh, some kind of a ceasefire. No one expected that such an elongation of the situation. Now, uh, sanctions you may put on one nation, but remember that there's a reverse effect on you also. Now, in the case of Europe, uh, the whole dependency on energy, that is the major issue for them. 
besides that other fact that they were all emerging from the pandemic. Mm. You see, how the pandemic had affected the whole world. Remember, India minus 24% in the first 20 in the first year after the pandemic. We have really bounced back. I mean, India needs to be proud of itself the way it has bounced back. Most European economies are expecting, which are larger economies, are expecting about 3% will be, will be lucky if they get a 3% uh, upward movement. Most smaller emerging economies are 1.5 to 1.7%. Nothing more than that. We in India are 7.5% that we are looking at. So I think, I think we are in a different part of the, of the universe at the moment. But this is the situation in Europe. And uh, with the energy cuts, uh, uh, you know, uh, overall uh, availability of food security, which is, a, which is a major problem, energy security, and by and by, Europe is planning to ensure that 90% dependency on Russian energy is taken away, uh, as far as Europe is concerned. So much of the energy will probably come from the Middle East, uh, and very largely we are hearing from the African countries, Nigeria, Angola, and places like that, uh, that, that it, it will be made up. But uh, uh, it is, of course, it is pinching them as much. The next one year is going to be a very serious uh, effort, a serious uh, effect, which will take place on the European economies itself. While that is true, the Russians are also affected, right? Absolutely. Of course, in this emerging picture, you are aware the information game has been such that no one can depend on what statistics and figures. I am quoting actually basically IMF figures. What uh, what I have been reading is more, I, I thought so this is something which is more middle path, IMF, which is giving you a, a unbiased uh, opinion of, of both sides. But they're talking about uh, Russia, um, uh, a contraction of the economy by 8 to 9%. And uh, six months down the line, that contraction would go to as much as 16%. That is the time when you find that the Russians, will it will start hurting the Russians. At the moment, it is still not hurting the Russians. And uh, uh, the Russians are still in a position to be able to continue the push that they are giving in Ukraine. It is, uh, I would say, the real effect will start coming three months from now, perhaps. That's what my uh, research is showing me. Uh, how much are the Russians uh, willing to cut back? How much are they willing to tighten their belts? That's a moot point uh, at this moment. But the Russians are used to war. The Russian... Uh, tradition and the kind of casualties that they've taken in the Second World War is just nobody's uh, business. So the Russians uh, can last out. It's not that they will not last out. But uh, that which should bring us to the issue as to how long more will this war continue? What is the ground situation in Ukraine uh, at the moment? Is, it, is there any possibility that the Ukrainians could ultimately win this war? Because we are hearing of a tremendous amount of uh, uh, support, military support that they are receiving in terms of arms and uh, ammunition. I was uh, looking at the recent figures in the last couple of weeks, the commitment which uh, the United States, France, Germany, and the UK have given is about 8 to $10 billion of weapons immediately being flown in. All the important weapons. The Western routes are still open in Ukraine. The, the Russians have started targeting some areas uh, in the western Ukraine at the moment, but that's not sufficient yet. Those routes are well established, uh, corridors are well established, they are fairly well secured, and uh, oh, through them all this material is coming in. So that's the next point that we should be discussing as to how long more can this war sustain in Ukraine. It needs, it seems quite, uh, you know, not very, in a, in a, not a very uh, simple site or simple the situation to analyze because at the end of it, the, the objectives that the Russians had set out for themselves have kind of been pushed around. And we had uh, Sergei Lavrov day for yesterday when he was in Turkey talking about the denazification of Eastern Ukraine. And he mentioned this very clearly. So that kind of showed me a little bit of a shift in the narrative on that particular aspect. How do you think this will, you know, kind of play around within the future? Because we also have calls for negotiations coming in the most ardent of Western press today. So, do you see any breakthrough happening in the near future? Windows, windows emerging, uh, uh, Adi, everywhere. Uh, what you have very correctly quoted, the visit of the Russian foreign minister to uh, Turkey. 
And in that, the negotiations, very importantly, the negotiations to open up the uh, port of Odessa, Odessa to try and get grain out from there to help in the overall food security of the world. Now, this is something which is very, very interesting. Right? Uh, we didn't hear this uh, something like this uh, in, in the past. And there are, uh, there are appeals and uh, cautionary messages coming out from different countries of NATO now who are getting worried about their own economies, etc. When these sort of signals start coming up on both sides, someone will have to probably catch hold of this and, and, uh, and grab it and, and exploit the moment. You need to, because for the last two months, neither side has come to the table, right? So it, there are two ways of doing it. One is that you come down at the operational level and start discussing things on the table down there, hoping for a ceasefire immediately, and then, then think of taking it up. The other thing is to meet politically uh, in a different capital somewhere. Uh, you bring in Zelensky, you bring in uh, the Russian President Putin, or you bring in any other officials, trusted officials, etc. Uh, you have interlocutors in terms of the NATO officials, the United States themselves there, etc. It can start with this top-down approach. One of these approaches will have to be adopted, and I do predict that this should be on the cards in the near future. Because uh, I, I do suspect certain amount of back-channel calls are going on already. They are already going on. In these kind of situations, back-channels do mm. remain open. So some kind of back channel calls are going on and it's a matter of time before somewhere a back channel um, initiative may just succeed and someone, they may just get together once again in Turkey or they may get together somewhere in Germany or some any of these countries like that to have an initial icebreaker once again. So I am expecting that, but a lot depends on, as I said earlier, on the military situation on the ground. This morning's uh, media reports in India tell us that uh, there are uh, reports of uh, Eastern uh, Ukraine on its last legs, virtually, and uh, the Ukrainians are fighting, fighting very bravely, very boldly, but it does not seem that uh, they are likely to last out too long there. As you are perhaps aware, the Ukrainians have inducted seven, uh, no, was it seven? Yes, I think seven infantry brigades of uh, the territorial army. And these are understrength brigades into this area. They've done well. They've been able to push back many of the bridgeheads which were created. They've been able to push back some of the isolations which have been done around the cities. But that's about all. Uh, they have not been able to push in too many of, of this, of the modern kind of uh, weaponry which is coming in. Of course, uh, um, all the missile, missilery, the anti-tank missilery, um, the drones and all are already there. But some the, the reinforcements which are coming there are obviously not being able to reach there so effectively, right? So uh, if if Donbass falls, uh, virtually, I mean, in the sense like Mariupol fell, the whole of Donbass falls, I do suspect that that should be the trigger. Because I have said all along that uh, the major objectives of the Russians were one, regime change, which is not possible at the moment, Unless, unless we perceive that also as a possibility, because the the um, the manner in which uh, the Ukrainian president has held on has is continuing to insist there must be segments of society in Ukraine who must be feeling exactly the opposite. That enough is enough. Hundred days we have destroyed our nation. We have not achieved anything very major except a military pushback, and we don't know how the nation is going to be reconstructed all over again. So they may be looking for an alternative leadership. And if that happens, then you may just find a regime change which the Russians were looking for. Kiev and Kharkiv, um, not on the cards at all. So uh, they were looking for control of few cities. They will get a control of many cities in the Donbass area. They wanted Donbass under their control. They will probably get it. And they wanted a blockade along the Black Sea so that uh, Ukraine is virtually like a landlocked state and you know, all the assistance that can be uh, contemplated through the southern uh, routes cannot be done. That they have also achieved. In fact, now they are looking at negotiating methodologies by which uh, trade can continue, grain can come out of uh, Ukraine. One last point, this is a very uh, important thing also. This is the season in which sowing takes place in Ukraine. And we are aware that Ukraine is a 
granary for the world. Uh, apparently, all the fuel which has come is all being, you know, sent to the front lines, the tanks and the and the aircraft and things like that, which are which are being filled up at the moment with fuel. You have no fuel available for tractors. You have no fuel available for pumps, uh, for irrigation, nothing at all. So you are looking at a, the specter of a possibility of no growth, no no agrarian growth at all in Ukraine, which is going to affect a lot of people around the world. So these are some of the issues which will have to be kept in mind. I think you brought out a very interesting point and in that literally you know, coincides with the report I was reading in the morning. And before we move on to the Russia-China alliance, come back towards the east a little bit, I'd like to actually mention, you know, the Russians today put out a report saying that they are now, uh, Sergei Shoigu, who's their defense minister, put out that they are now fully connected by road and rail to Crimea. And there are reports yes. coming out of these tanks and a whole lot of stuff going that in that direction. So, yes, I did read these reports myself also. Yeah. So that tells you something when I connect from what you're saying to these reports, it tells you that the next battlefield is somewhere around Odessa to yes. cut off. Yes, Absol ab absolutely. This is a, uh, in fact, what the Russians are putting out is a form of consolidation. This is a message of consolidation that yes, they have sir. achieved uh, in Crimea. And Crimea, they are giving out this message clearly that Crimea is, is for keeping. They are, they are not going to part with the Crimea ever, anytime in the future. The infrastructure has been built, etc. And uh, this is also a part of the psychological wargaming which is going on simultaneously, keeping your adversary uh, pressurized. Wonderful, sir. So let's kind of, uh, you know, visit the Russia-China alliance, so-called, and you, you mentioned uh, this with that flyby. Sustainable, sir? Uh, let's first uh, talk about that in the context of India. A lot of people don't agree with me. Um, in fact, when I wrote, a lot of people told me, say, you're not right, you're not right. What I mentioned in, in my write-ups was that uh, the Russians would not want the Chinese to put any pressure on India on the line of actual control anytime in this period. Simply, my, my reasoning for it was the Russians would not want to be presented with options in which they are to side either with India or with China. It would be a very difficult thing for them. And therefore, their appeal to China would be, don't do anything. Keep your hands off from the Himalayan front completely. A lot of people didn't agree with me. They said, no, China, Russia does not have that kind of power today to influence uh, Chinese thinking and things like that. I, I, I thought maybe uh, it's important that a country as large as Russia, it's not just a question of its economy at the moment, etc. It is the large frontier it has got with China that... Uh, influences or keeps that aspect going. It's mm -hmm. good to have a huge country on your side. The Chinese would love it, right? So from that angle, I do continue to believe that the Chinese are, well, will, will play ball with the Russians at the moment and not to try to do anything awkward with uh, India. Secondly, now when it comes to the economy, the, the Chinese have their interests in their relationship with the United States, as we are aware, and why with the United States, with the with Europe, that relationship may have been partially dented, but uh, economics on the economics domain, I think the interests remain intact. No one wants that that disturbed, and therefore the Chinese may not play whole hog. You know, the, they may go along with the Russians but not show that kind of a commitment which will upset the apple cart when it comes to sanctions on China, for example. Of course, there are no sanctions on China, but uh, 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 we should not, one should not be thinking that the, uh, the Americans would be looking at potential sanctions on China in the future. It will upset their own economy too, to a very great extent. But uh, I, th I think the Chinese are smarter than that. Remember also the fact that uh, they are suffering the pandemic, the, 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 the nth wave of the pandemic within China at the moment. The pandemic perhaps created in Wuhan has now finally come back to roost within Chinese mainland itself. And that is going to affect the Chinese economy. We are already hearing of Chinese economy coming down to 4%, right? And maybe even less than that. So the, I don't think the Chinese would want to risk too many things at this time. Uh, someone may very well argue that if they could risk 
uh, a flyby on top of uh, Japan at this time on the East China Sea and um, in uh, in the uh, over the Pacific, then surely they can risk many other things. Well, that's a matter of conjecture. Then. These are more messaging rather than you know. Mess as, as, as a military I mean, I mean, man, you'll you kind of agree with me. This is more of a messaging yeah. rather than aggressive action. Let's let's talk about America now. So you know, Americans have provided a brilliant amount of support in terms of money to Ukraine. 63, 64, some people say 70 billion in terms of the entire collective West, if I may put it that way, is, uh, has been pumped into Ukraine. Effectiveness, this, that is all secondary. And I am not wanting to get into that as a matter of fact, because we've kind of covered it. Uh, the question is about American military support while they promise uh, something like that, because we had Joe Biden kind of mentioning about military support to Taiwan. And that's one of the biggest questions which is being asked today. Would the American standing be affected by its falling short of military support uh, in Ukraine and the situation in Afghanistan? How do you see this game playing out? I, I got you. I get your question. It's a, and it's a good question. Um, it's a question of a comparison that the United States, well, let's start from Vietnam. They <laughs> got deployed in Vietnam and fought in Vietnam, right? Then... Uh, they came and fought in Afghanistan, boots on ground in Afghanistan, right? Uh, they've had forward deployment of all over the Middle East. They've suffered sometimes. Um, they've had troops on the ground willing and ready to fight in Europe during the Cold War. Uh, post the Cold War, the reduced strength of troops and uh, also willing perhaps to go to war tomorrow if it had come to some other adversaries. But here is a situation where they are only fighting proxy. Uh, at, at the moment uh, in Ukraine, right? Uh, I, I do feel that uh, the U.S. appreciation of the situation would have been that uh, it is far too dangerous to get involved with in war fighting directly. NATO getting involved in war fighting directly uh, on the, in the plains of uh, of uh, of Europe is something which was not even contemplated during the at the height of the of the Cold War. In fact, at the height of the Cold War, what was contemplated was that if the Russian war machine had come through those very famous uh, operational maneuver groups, etc., and made a dash, then it was ultimately be tactical nukes, starting with tactical nukes and lead to a mutually assured destruction, which is what the deterrence factor was there. Now, as far as Taiwan is concerned, would the Americans be willing to put boots on ground? That's a very, very interesting debate. Uh, remember, the United States is deployed in those areas, South Korea, Japan, bases in those areas, very, very strong naval presence. But I'm not sure any part of the world really knows or can assess at this time as to how a, a campaign involving war fighting is going to pan out anywhere in the area of East Asia. I, I'm not sure. People have written about it and things like that. But uh, I cannot fathom this at the moment as to how this can happen. Uh, if, the, if, the, if the Chinese, if the PLA decides to invade, uh, put a blockade around Taiwan, what would they expect the Americans to do? To try and break the blockade uh, with the help of their very, very strong Navy, the US Navy? Would they be willing to come in and do beach landings? And, do a push against the PLA. I'm not so sure the, the Americans would be willing to do that. So all this is in the air, so to say, in this, in this area. Uh, no one can say as to whether the North Koreans, if the North Koreans had, uh, had uh, made a very, very threatening gestures towards South Korea, a potential invasion, would the United States uh, ensure a reinforcement of its deployment into South Korea. I'm sure they would do it because South Korea is something which is very dear to them. And uh, uh, they have fought before in Korea too. But about Taiwan, I'm not certain. And uh, now what's happened in Ukraine with what is happening in Ukraine and with the, the what happened in Iraq and Afghanistan where the United States clearly did not um, uh, establish a domination or clearly was not a victor. Uh, I would say 
there would be apprehension in the minds of the US military leadership and as much in the political leadership, as much in civil society uh, there. And that is something that the Chinese would be assessing very, very strongly at this time. Not to say at any time that I under assess what the US military capability is. My God, the United States is a huge war machine in every dimension when it comes to space, when it comes to water, the underwater, the land, and cyber, or anything. No one can match the US armed forces uh, of, of the day to day. But to be confronted in a restricted area by a very large country who's also economically very strong and aspiring to be a superpower, it is not easy to assess what, how, how a confrontation will really pan out into the future. That is one of the, I think, one of the biggest <clears throat> geopolitical questions, especially with regard to Southeast Asia, because we see the temperatures kind of boiling up uh, in this entire region, which brings me to a very, you know, uh, simple question. So we had two military incidents last week in the Southeast Asia uh, and South China Sea. One in both involving air assets of China, Australia, and China and Canada. Uh, these kind of confrontations, the Russians have been used to it. This has been happening for decades now. And, you know, it's when it, the tensions are not high, it's more of a lot of fun. And you see these photographs coming out and they're clicking photographs. And it's, it's, it's lighthearted to a large extent tactically. It's not the same case in the Southeast Asia. What if there is a mistake, sir? Well, uh, first of all, of course, uh, these are, yes, they are, these are issues which keep uh, emerging from time to time. And now with Australia, Canada, yes, both countries, in fact, much more Australia, which is uh, concerned about uh, um, uh, ocean security in the Pacific in, in its uh, areas of interest, particularly the South China Seas. And also, of course, in Southeast Asia, Papua New Guinea and we are northwards, upwards in, the, in those areas, uh, they are always uh, concerned about these kind of issues. Um, you see, the freedom of navigation is at the moment very much there. And that's what this whole fight which is taking place, or rather the struggle of the, with China which is taking place at the moment is all about freedom of navigation. Absolutely. And uh, at the moment, of course, these kind of confrontations which they can take place will bring about tension between these countries this is something which needs to be guarded against, particularly. Mm -hmm. uh, both Canada and Australia, New Zealand to a great extent also. The Vietnamese Navy for that matter. In fact, the naval flotillas of all these countries uh, are all looking out primarily to ensure that these waters remain free and navigation is not a problem. But uh, the presence of uh, foreign navies and uh, the potential of some kind of standoffs against them from time to time, uh, these are irritants. And uh, these irritants, I suppose a good uh, naval commander will be able to tell us as to what will be the immediate effect of a single incident of a confrontation at sea of this nature. Will this lead to something immediately bigger? Or is it easy to be able to play it down and, and uh, sort of pull back, disengage immediately. That is a very important aspect that will have to be kept in mind by all these countries which are looking at the, the waters of the Pacific. Well, this is the area which is, the, which is going to be the playing field of the future. A dangerous situation that you're explaining, sir. I mean, it kind of, you know, the small hair at the back of your head kind of just go <laughs> off when you think about something like that because... Uh, the chances of actually a military mistake, which are, I mean, it's 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 uh, human, so it will might just happen one fine day. Absolutely, we we've had this before. We've had the USS Pueblo, if you remember, many many years ago, yeah. 1969, when I started my study of geopolitics. 1969, the USS Pueblo incident uh, took place at that time. Now these are the kind of incidents which can happen uh, anywhere in these places. I mean, uh, the First World War was triggered by a, by a silly accident, if I may. Yes. A killing of a person which... You yes. Know. So, that's that's the reason... Sarajevo, Sarajevo, Sarajevo 1914. Yes. Bringing the figure to the conflict. So, now, the last question I want to ask you, and this is going to be, I'm sure, a little bit of a 
you know, uh, crystal ball gazing and it's probably going to involve a little more peeping into the future because we've kind of established within this conversation that things aren't going very well for the Ukrainians militarily and that will shape up the entire game in terms of the negotiations going forward. No matter it's Russia, Ukraine or Russia and, you know, Ukraine plus plus or whatever, however it comes out to be. How do you see this sure outcome coming out and the geopolitics then changing around one in the European Union, the Americas, and of course, Southeast Asia? Because if there is an outright victory, there is going to be a price to pay for the West. Interesting, yes. Uh, and one of the things is, uh, we are hearing this morning itself was, for example, the Iranians taking out all the surveillance which the IAEA has got on their nuclear facility. Cameras, yes, sir. Which means that virtually the, the JCPOA has now Indeed. been dismantled. So Vienna, whatever is happening in Vienna, we don't know what the final outcome is going to be. But this seems to be a typical implication, a fallout of what is happening. The control over these countries, uh, uh, supposedly rogue nations, we can't call Iran a rogue nation, but supposedly the American perception of rogue nations, obviously the control over this is, is, is just not there. Earlier, if you remember, the JCPOA was actually a contract between all the five super, all the five permanent members of the of the uh, 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 United Nations Security Council, right? If you remember, it was five plus one the the, the whole thing which had taken place uh, at that time, and and you're immediately finding a, 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 a dilution of that taking place on the ground, and Iran is taking full advantage of it. Now. One or two things which emerge immediately from this question. Number one, we are going to see a stronger NATO, a committed NATO. NATO which had got frittered away and uh, with its morale to a great extent uh, dented after the withdrawal from Afghanistan and the manner of uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan, they've got the opportunity in three months' time without, without deploying one soldier. They've got the, they, they have been able to retrieve their uh, image to a great extent. They've been able to retrieve their unity to a great extent. That unity may get dented if, the, if this war elongates uh, far beyond. That may happen. But at the moment, that unity is very much there. The relevance has come back with Finland, with the, with the Switzerland and countries like that, all wanting to now join in earlier countries which were very, very reluctant to join them, are all now willing to uh, join them. So this is one major thing which will happen, NATO. And then possibility of NATO not just remaining Europe-bound. They've had a bad experience, of course, in Afghanistan, but the potential of the Quad Plus, the Quad Plus with all these countries, France, the UK, right? We, we are likely to see France and UK. We may see Vietnam, of course, from the Southeast Asia itself. These are the kind of countries which are going to join in into the future. So uh, while we're looking at one side where we are looking at the war in Ukraine, we are also looking at the fallout of all this taking place on the Indo-Pacific, right? The other thing is the Middle East from which uh, the focus had lifted completely uh, seems to have come back into the, uh, into the focus of attention, uh, especially after this uh, Iranian decision. Uh, there is a visit by uh, the Israeli uh, premier, I think, or the foreign minister, I'm not very certain, to the UAE. And they are discussing out the fallout of uh, what the decision the Iranians are taking at the moment. So things are hotting up. Once Israel, Iran, the equations in Middle East are very clear. You can have a Saudi-Iran standoff. You can have an Israel-Iran standoff. You can have a Palestinian issue breaking out again, Hamas, uh, Hezbollah, etc. These are the three or four things which keep occurring in the Middle East. Any of them could break out at this particular time and you will find attention once again focused back here. When the attention comes focused back here into these kind of things, you will find all kinds of passions coming up all around the world, particularly in the Islamic world. And that is the time when you find gravitation of terrorist groups. This is how the ISIS started. It all started with the ISIS like this, right? The gravitation of terror groups, etc. We are not hearing too much of what's happening in Afghanistan at the moment. Um, uh, the Taliban, of course, is uh, you know maintaining its, its uh, the stability so far, but on the social front, 
Uh, much of what they had promised, they are not delivering. In fact, they are reversing most of the decisions that they had arrived at in Qatar with the, with the Americans before the uh, final withdrawal had taken place. North Afghanistan, what is happening in terms of the terror groups, we still don't know fully. There is a gravitation of a lot of terror groups into that area. We have not much of reports coming out from there. So we are finding that while there are there is a general uh, silence, uh, near silence, in many of these areas, because of all the attention which has been focused on Ukraine, the moment the war stops in Ukraine and uh, efforts are made to try and get people on the negotiating table, uh, I don't contemplate that uh, it's going to be hunky-dory with the restoration of, uh, you know, the rolling back of sanctions immediately. All this is not going to happen. Lots of things have become virtually permanent. You must have heard McDonald's and Burger King have both virtually wound up their business um, uh, as far as Russia is concerned. Many of the banks have, have uh, many of the, of the uh, uh, white goods uh, firms have all wound up their businesses in these, these areas and these are not going to come back uh, in a hurry. So the effect on the world economy, global economy, recovery from the, of the global economy itself is all going to get affected. And this, this will continue in this manner. The focus will be of the moment something happens, something positive develops in Eastern Europe or in Central Europe, you will find uh, the effect will travel to the Indo-Pacific. There with the United States itself will want to energize its efforts uh, to try and bring in greater equanimity between various states, take more people on board, have more consultations on security, etc. India will be in the middle of this. There's no doubt about it because uh, we are members of the Quad now. We are strategic partners of the United States, right? Although we are friendly, we've got a friendly relationship with Russia. One of the very interesting things which will emerge from this will be how will we manage our relationship between the Russians and the Americans? Should there be a Russian victory on the battlefield? If that victory takes place on the battlefield, then obviously, uh, you see, you can't just cast aside the Russians. You can't cast aside the relationship. To pursue a relationship with the Quad also, at the moment, the world is accepting India as it is. Right? Uh, in fact, many of them have appreciated the Indian stance of the manner in which they've handled this whole business of keeping an equanimity between the United States, uh, between NATO and Russia. How this, how do we handle this the hereafter is going to be a major challenge for us. That's a well-rounded answer, so I must commend you on that because you've taken us across the across the globe, South Pacific to you know uh, Eastern Europe to NATO and brought us back home. I must say that's a that's an interesting uh, roundup. Thank you, sir. It's always a pleasure talking you know geopolitics with you because and this is a especially an interesting discussion because we are not focused on to China or Pakistan. It's basically a larger picture that we're discussing. Uh, sadly, it doesn't happen in India that much. I mean, the whole uh, euphoria for the war was there in the initial first 20, 30 days, and then it just faded away to back home local politics. Uh, but a lot of people, Adi, are following, a lot of people are following the war from a <laughs> from an angle of interest, they do want to know more about the military situation in Ukraine. A lot of queries keep coming back to me and it's very interesting to explain it to them. By and large in India, the overall interest in military affairs has gone up by leaps and bounds. Oh, yes. That's a very positive sign. That is there, sir. That is there. And that's something which, which I see personally because I'm more focused towards military discussions with military personnel. So I'm able to make a little bit of a space for myself, which is... Yes, which is something that is telling me that uh, people are more willing to learn about this kind of stuff. And Absolutely. it's, it's Absolutely. a reality that we need to face. As always, sir, it's a pleasure talking to you. Till next time, till I decide a very solid subject for you as well. Uh, <laughs> Jai Hind, sir. Thank you very much. And Jai Hind to all our viewers.